This is the 10th in our series of messages called Fixer Upper. For five seasons, Fixer Upper was a very popular show on television. Uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines so would, would get a buyer uh, for, uh, who bought a home, and then they would have a budget to, to remodel it, maybe 100000 maybe 150000 whatever the budget was, they would remodel the house, and people would end up with a house that's a Fixer Upper becoming a, a beautiful, beautiful home. In our series, we're not talking about fixing up houses, but fixing up our minds. Uh, we want to develop Christian minds, minds the way God wants us to think, minds marked by joy. Uh, one thing I know for certain, whether you're young or old, single or married, divorced or widowed, you want to be happy. And Jesus came to give us joy. Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. God's will is for us to have life. He wants us to enjoy his creation and the people in this world. Jesus said, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Uh, Jesus wants us to experience joy. Now, you may have been thinking as uh, we've been going through this series, I'm talking about happiness and joy, and you're thinking, yeah, this is sure kind of light stuff. Why don't we get on to something that matters, like spiritual warfare or spiritual gifts or, or living in holiness? Let's get over this and move on. Well, it turns out joy is a major theme in the Bible. I haven't actually ranked them, but I'm sure it's in the top 20. The Psalms are filled with praise, calls for us to praise God all day long. Solomon, who is called the wisest person who ever lived other than Jesus Christ, in his book Ecclesiastes says, so I saw that there's nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work. God doesn't want us to hate our work hate our jobs. He wants us to enjoy our work. Find a, 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 a profession that you can enjoy and you feel like you're making a difference in the world and enjoy it. And he gets to the end of his book. He's tried all kinds of things. What brings purpose in life? What brings joy? What's meaningful? And he says, you who are young, be happy while you're young. You are young. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. You notice how you see children that are preschool, grade school, they're just filled with excitement and joy. God says, I want you to have that. That's a good thing. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. He says, follow the, uh, the, the things of your heart, but remember, you're going to stand judgment before God. You don't want to just go off the tracks. So then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body. God doesn't want us living uh, in, in anxiety and just dreading each day and cynical and unhappy. He wants us to experience joy. Solomon writes in Proverbs, a happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. He says a happy heart is the way to live, not a crushed spirit. All the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual feast. You like feasts, don't you? How many like Thanksgiving? He says that's the way I want you to live all year long with a cheerful heart. Elton Trueblood, the former Quaker chaplain at Harvard, and for a time at Stanford, wrote, the Christian is joyful. That's what we've been talking about in this ser series. Not because he's blind to injustice and suffering. The call to joy and happiness doesn't mean we, we're, we're, you know, naive. But because he's convinced that these, in the light of the divine sovereignty, are never ultimate. God's in control. The humor of the Christian is not a way of denying the tears, but rather a way of affirming something which is deeper than tears. Christians have something that's deeper than tears. We have the assurance that we know the Savior of the world. 
Even though there's so much chaos and evil in the world, we realize that God is in control. And so we look beyond that to what God's doing in the world. We have something for which to be joyful. In this series, we're looking at the Apostle Paul's teaching about joy in the book of Philippians. Joy is the theme of the book. Paul uses uh, the word joy, Cairo, the Greek word, 19 times in this book. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. He puts it in the present tense, meaning you're supposed to do it continually. Always. You say, I'm not sure I can do always. That's the call. But it's not just a call to be happy always. To rejoice in the Lord. That's the command. To keep your eyes focused on him. And if you didn't get it, he says, I will say it again, rejoice. Why is Paul so joyful? How can we experience joy? The answer lies in another word Paul used 16 times in the book of Philippians, the word mind. The key to happiness lies in the way we think. In Philippians, Paul identifies several wrong ways of thinking. One wrong way of thinking is thinking, my, the, my circumstances dictate my happiness level. You know, if, if I'm sick, I'm dealing with a, a problem, unemployed, or having, you know, whatever, then of course I'm unhappy. Paul says, no. Look at my life. I gave my life to Christ. Everywhere I went, I was opposed, hated, I was beaten and thrown in prison, and he's writing this book from prison. He says the way to think right is to be God-centered in your thinking. Whatever you're facing, look at what God is doing, how God is greater. If your purpose in life is to serve Christ, he's the center of your life, you can be happy in whatever circumstances because you can serve Christ in any circumstance. Paul learned he could serve Christ as well in prison as he could out of prison. In chapter 2, Paul identifies a wrong way of thinking about people. We tend to think, you know, I'd be happy. I'd be fine if it wasn't for people. But there's so many people in my life that do such stupid things. And they're, they're, they're cruel. And I just can't get them out of my mind. And so I become unhappy. Paul says, no. The right way to think about people is to think of them as more important than yourself. If you think of people as more important than yourself, uh, they will not be so bothersome to you. Now, Paul begins in Philippians chapter 3. If you want to use our Bibles, it's on page 1,180. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. How does Paul find joy rotting in prison? Why isn't he angry? Why isn't he depressed? He finds joy in Christ. The point he makes in this chapter is we find joy in Christ. Remember, we want to be God-centered. Rejoice in the Lord. In Philippians 3, 1 to 11, he gives us three ways that we can find joy in Christ. One, we find joy in knowing Christ and salvation through faith in him. Verse 2, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Paul calls these people evildoers, mutilators. He's referring to people who rely on good works to find salvation. And they miss out on the grace in Christ. He calls them mutilators because their whole focus is on seeing that Gentile believers uh, that come to Christ should keep the whole Jewish law, including the men being circumcised. They insist on this external ritual of cutting away the foreskin of the male anatomy. For it is we who are the circumcision, Paul says, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Paul says true Christians are those who have the Holy Spirit and put no confidence in themselves. No confidence in themselves. That's interesting. You ask the average person on the streets, when you die, will you go to heaven? And they'll say something like, well, 
I'm not perfect, but I try to be a good person. I've done a lot of good things, so yeah, I think I will get into heaven. They put confidence in themselves. How do we grow as Christians? How do I get from where I am to where God wants me to be? Uh, Paul gives an incredible testimony here. Here are some key verses in his story. Paul is moving from a proud, self-confident, intellectual Jew to having no confidence in his human abilities. He's learning healthy self-distrust to put no confidence in himself. Uh, we tend to think of uh, becoming a Christian as kind of a self-improvement program. Maybe you walk into church and you don't know much at all about Christ and the Christian faith. Maybe you're a little rough around the edges. You give your life to Christ and then you see yourself gradually getting better. You're improving but Paul says the real growth in Christian faith means we realize more and more how weak we are. We're sinful. Uh, spiritual growth, maturity, is where you get to a place where you put no confidence in yourself. Paul knows that uh, Jews will claim that he's a Christian but not an authentic Jew. So Paul gives his Jewish credentials. Verse 4, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. Pharisee was the top of the top in keeping the law. As far as zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul says that everything else that he's done in his life is like garbage compared with knowing Christ. All the awards, all the degrees, the accomplishments mean nothing compared with finding Christ. Finding salvation in Christ brings him joy. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Trying to earn our way into heaven sucks the joy out of life because you never know if you've done enough. You think, am I good enough? Maybe I need to do one more thing. Knowing that we're saved by grace, by what Christ did for us on the cross, can give us joy. The first step to becoming a Christian is to admit, God, I've sinned. I can't do this. I can't be good enough to work my way into heaven. And you accept him into your life and you depend on him for forgiveness. And then you continue to live that way the rest of your life, admitting your weakness and your sin and depending on him day by day through the day. There's a second way we find joy in Christ. We find joy in knowing the power of Christ's resurrection. Micah read this verse earlier. Read this with me. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Paul wants to know the, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1.19, and his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Uh, Paul says the same power that God used when he raised Christ from the dead is available to you if you've given your life to Christ. That means you have power over temptation. You have power over depression. You have power over grief. Christ's power within us gives us joy. Paul Eshelman uh, wrote a great book called I Just Saw Jesus. It's the story of uh, Campus Crusade uh, 
uh, turning the, the book of Matthew into a movie that they've shown in uh, countries around the world. Their specialty is taking it into places that have never had a movie in their language. And, uh, and people, all people come to see this movie because it's in their language. And in uh, uh, Jeruk Turo, Indonesia, a witch doctor slipped in which doctor's a you know, worshiper of Satan. And uh, he, he watched and, uh, a little bit of the movie, uh, Jesus talking, and all the people in the village were there, and they were looking and uh, listening. And he, qu he made a quiet uh, and quick exit. And when he got outside, he, he, he spat on the ground. He said, our people don't need this God that these foreigners are bringing to us. I'll make them pay. And he went back to his, his little house and he pulled down the blind so nobody could see what he's doing and he was uh, putting together a curse on the foreigners that had come in and uh, the people who uh, would put their faith in Christ. And once he was done, he sat back to just wait, let the fun begin. So the movie was done and... All the people that stayed after to talk to the uh, Campus Crusade team members uh, were leaving. And they were walking by and he was surprised. Nobody was coming under the curse. He was thought, ah, that's weird. Maybe it just takes longer to kick in. And then some people came by his house and they, they fell down and they began to writhe in pain. And they were just in agony. And one of the team members knelt down with them and prayed for them. And the pain began to go away. And eventually, they were fine. This thing was happening all over the town. People would get really sick and be hurting, suffering badly. And then a team member would pray for them. Or a, a villager who had just given their lives to Christ would pray for them. And then they would be well. So the witch doctor's curse had worked, but he hadn't counted on the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Jesus' power is greater than Satan's. He provides resurrection power to all who believe. We see Jesus' resurrection power in a number of ways. I talk about this all the time. It's shown through the mundane things of life. You, you pray at the beginning of your day for God to go with you as, through all your meetings, whatever you're doing, and you see him answer prayers all through the day. Uh, you see his resurrection power like, like this story I just shared with you, power over Satan. One of the ways we see his power is power in healing. Uh, one of the people in our church, Dugan Foster, um, shared with me, I don't know, a month or so ago uh, about uh, a, a, a miracle in his life. Uh, look at his story. So my name is Dugan Foster. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I moved here to Oregon in June of 1996. Um, it's a little bit about my, my, my background. Uh, a week before my 16th birthday, uh, October 7th, 1993, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Uh, the doctors in Tulsa told uh, my parents I probably would not live. And... Uh, my, my, my mom and dad refused to accept that answer, so they traveled all over the United States till they found a doctor who could do the surgery. So uh, November 5th, 1993, I underwent about uh, 13 and a half, 14 hours of brain surgery at the University of California in San Francisco. Uh, as a result of the surgery, I was left blind. I had a short-term memory loss. And uh, also as a result, I don't sweat anymore. And so I have a hard time cooling my body down. Uh, you know, they had to completely remove part of the brain, the pituitary gland, which is a very big part of the body. And so they didn't, most doctors didn't give me a year to live. Uh, this November will be 25 years since that one year. It says since, since the surgery. Uh, I graduated high school in 1996. And um, during a routine checkup in uh, January of 98, my tumor came back. And it was, it was like a nightmare come true. Uh, so March 5th of 1998, I went a second surgery uh, up at Oregon Health Sciences University. It was an experimental type surgery. 
But um, it didn't really go as he had planned. And uh, he said that if any of the fluids from the tumor got into my body, that would probably kill me. Well, the tumor popped like a balloon. And so all the fluids were dispersed into my body. Uh, so the doctor was very frazzled. The next day they did an MRI and uh, to see what damage had been done. And it was all there, but my vision came back. And uh, for the next about five, 10 years, my vision slowly got better and better. It has stagnated. Uh, it's not getting any worse. It's not getting any better, but not getting any worse either. But I'm alive and I can see. Well, every summer, my grandma and grandpa would take me to vacation Bible school. As I got older, they would take me to youth camp every summer. And that's what really put the foundation of the Lord into my life. My faith is what has brought me through through every, this is why I'm here today is because of my faith. I look, I look back at it and I get terrified just thinking about the whole brain surgery. And I, but I think about then, I, I, would, I didn't seem real scared. And I think as God was carrying me at that point, it, I wasn't by myself. Uh, you know, I wasn't, you know, like, like the footprints in the sand. There was only one set of footprints because God was carrying me through that. And I feel that he brought me to where I am today for a reason. Because I get, like, I, I get terrified just thinking about it. And he's brought me here today. And I feel he has a plan for me in my life. And uh, I feel I'm slowly fulfilling it. Living life on an everyday basis is a struggle for me with no pituitary gland. Your pituitary controls everything in your body. So everyday life can be a struggle for me. So about four years ago, I was at a really low point in my life, really struggling with depression. And my mom, um, I was, well, one night I was praying, I was like, God, I need an answer what I need to do in my life to make myself happy. And, uh, that, next, that, that night, my mom saw me and she was doing laundry and she said, uh, have you ever thought about going back to school? I was 38 years old and I was like, I don't want to go back to school, but I did it. Went back to school, graduated my associate's degree uh, last year and I now got a great job. But I still had a void in my life. I really wanted to find someone, you know, to, be, to spend the rest of my life with. And uh, about two and a half, three years ago, I was uh, introduced to my wife now. We got married 11 months ago, and uh, my life is now complete. One day, I want to share my story. I have a, I'm writing a book of the many miracles God has performed in my life. And um, God is good. So Dugan has experienced Christ's resurrection power multiple times in his life. Paul mentions a third way we can find joy in Christ. This one surprises us. We find joy in knowing participation in Christ's suffering. Micah read this verse, that I may know him, and why don't you read this with me, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Uh, we're surprised by this one because we wonder, how can suffering lead to joy? Paul becomes a Christian, and he begins sharing his faith in Christ. And everywhere he goes, he's opposed by people. Uh, he's imposed by Gentiles who uh, his, his, uh, the faith in Christ is... is uh, is a concern to their business, selling products that uh, are worship of Greek gods and Roman gods. Uh, he's a threat to Jews who don't want to see people leave the Jewish faith and go to Christianity, but he's also opposed by Jewish Christians who feel like he's not having Gentiles obey all the law. So he's hated by all kinds of groups. Yet he, he's, thrown, he's beaten many times, he's thrown in prison, yet he's filled with joy. Paul considers it a privilege to suffer for Christ. He sees in his suffering that he's getting to identify with what Christ went through when he carried the cross to 
uh, Golgotha and then was crucified. So knowing Christ and knowing the power of the resurrection doesn't mean you'll have an easy life. When we give our lives to Christ and uh, attempt to live in this world utilizing his power, we'll be opposed by Satan, certainly, often by non-believers. Suffering is not the opposite of joy, but it can lead to joy. Suffering can be a path to joy. Uh, there are many people who do not believe in Christ today, and they say the reason is because I can't believe that there's a God who allows so much evil and suffering in the world. You ever thought that? How can there be a God who allows all this carnage, terrible things that happen? If you've ever used pain as your reason for not believing in God, proceed with caution. It's insulting to commandeer someone else's suffering as your reason for not believing in God. Because suffering and pain throughout history has been a catalyst to lead many people to Christ. Let me give you an example. 1949, Mao Zedong took over uh, power in China. That's when it became a communist nation. When he uh, took power, there were 500,000 Christians in China. One of the first things he wanted to do was to get rid of all Christians, stamp out the Christian faith. Uh, every morning, uh, he, put the, he put speakers on uh, like lampposts and trees, and every morning uh, the, it would be blasted out, East is Red. It's a song about Mao being the savior of China. He expelled all the missionaries, persecuted Christians, put many of them in prison. But Mao was prob probably China's greatest evangelist. Under his leadership, half a million Christians grew to a hundred million. Under Mao's Great Leap Forward, 1958 to 1962, the Communist Party attempted to transform their agrarian society into a socialist society with rapid industrialization. They took farmers and forced them to work in fledgling industries in cities or just outside cities. It was an economic disaster. 45 million Chinese died during the Great Leap Forward. Just to give you that some context, 55 million people died during World War II. In 1949, China had 300 languages and 1,000 dialects. Mao signed a decree that Mandarin, Mandarin would be the official language of the country. It was a good move. Uh, when he took power, there were 47,000 pictorial characters, and he reduced them to 1,500. So people could read his little red book. It could be small. In 1949, only 6% of the people in China could read. Today, 90% can read. So all those were good moves. But there was an unintended consequence. Now, the Bible could be translated into Chinese. Are people reading Mao's Red Book today? No, they're reading the Bible. Many Christians under Mao's leadership uh, who graduated from universities, when the communist government found out that they were Christians, that they attended underground churches, they punished them. They gave them the worst jobs in the most remote provinces. High school students who were Christians, they were found to be Christians, were not allowed to go to universities. They were sent to uh, do heavy labor in remote provinces. When these university graduates who were Christians and high school graduates who were Christians were sent out into these remote provinces, they had never had Christians visit them before. They carried with them the gospel, and the gospel began to spread from village to village. So instead of killing the church, Mao spread it. 
With all the suffering and pain people went through in the great leap forward, Mao then started the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. The point of the Cultural Revolution was to make China a fully communist country and get rid of all religious uh, things from the past. So they want to get rid of, of Bibles and Christian literature and, and other kinds too, like Buddhist teachings and, and uh, Muslim. And they wanted to get rid of all, uh, you know, Christians in, in government and teaching positions and uh, intellectuals. They were all banished, punished. During this time, the Chinese people were like, what is going on? And they began looking for answers. And many were driven to the underground church. Suffering led millions of Chinese to Christ. Let's bring it up to date. Ezra Mingri Jin, pastor of Zion Church in Beijing, the largest church in Beijing, 1,500 members, was arrested last year for his refusal to mount uh, recognition cameras on his pulpit. In other words, the government wanted to see who's attending this church. Wouldn't do it. So he was arrested, and most of the 1,500 members were arrested as well. Under President Jinping's current Chinese culture campaign, which is eerily reminiscent of the uh, Cultural Revolution, the big point of it is to remove Christian books and Bibles from their country. China Aid, a Christian human rights organization, estimates that 100,000 Christians were arrested in China last year. The more the Chinese government persecutes Christians, guess what? The faster the underground church grows. We estimate today that there are 300 million Christians in China. More people are becoming Christians in China than I, I just finished reading a book by Randy Alcorn. Randy's a local author, lives in Gresham, called Safely Home. It's a novel. I don't read many novels, but this is a, was a good one. And it's the story of a Chinese pastor who's arrested. And uh, he and his family are persecuted uh, before he's arrested. And, and then he's put in prison. And visiting him there is a businessman from Portland. And... Uh, Randy lives in Portland, so most of his novels have to do with Portland characters. And um, uh, this, this American uh, visits him in prison. And he's just amazed. He, he, he looks at him and he can see he's been beaten, uh, bleeding, uh, you know, he's just in terrible condition. He says, I got to get you out of here. And I got, you know, he's, so he's trying to work every, every lever he can to, to get him out of prison. But what he's surprised by is the joy of his friend, who's a, a Christian pastor. They went to college together, I think at Harvard. And uh, it, this is a novel, but, you know. And um, um, he's, just, he's just amazed. He, he's joyful, but he's saying, hey, nobody wants to clean these, he's, he's, he's in solitary confinement, but he offers to clean the, the, the prison. And so he gets to go in to these other prisoners who are in solitary confinement and clean. And the whole time he can talk to them about Christ. And many people are coming to Christ in prison. He experiences joy even in the midst of suffering. And the Apostle Paul gives the same testimony. Even though he's beaten and uh, so many hardships and persecuted and put in prison so many times, he experiences joy. He rejoiced in being able to suffer for Christ. So here's Paul's point. We find joy in Christ. We find joy in knowing Christ and salvation through faith in him. We, we find joy in knowing that our salvation is finished. We don't have to do anything to get into heaven except believe in Christ. We find joy in knowing the power of Christ's resurrection. The same power that God used when he raised Christ from the dead is available in us and to us. 
And we find joy in knowing participation in Christ's suffering. It's a joy, actually, to have things happen. Jory and I were talking just the other day. When her first book came out, The Power of Modeling, she had a good uh, a Jewish friend who was all excited to read it. And then she read it. And the next time Jory came, they were on a tennis team together. She said, hi. And she wouldn't even look at her. And she said, I can't believe it. Your book that you say Jesus is the only way to God. You saying I'm not going to heaven? You're saying other people, you know. And she never talked to her again. So Jory lost that friendship. So this is an example of, you know, for your faith, you will be opposed. You will not be popular with everybody. But you can find joy in experiencing a little bit of what Christ suffered. Father, thank you for these lines by the Apostle Paul and that he had joy and he calls us to joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, he says. Help us to do that this week. Help us not to be sad sacks, cynical, angry, but to experience your joy, your happiness, real life. Even if we're facing some difficult circumstances, friends that are being cruel, suffering in some way. May we experience your joy this week and live the way you want us to live. You want to have that? Why don't you commit that yourself to God this week to tell him, I want to rejoice in you always and experience the power of your resurrection, even joy in suffering. You pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.